Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the In the Eleven podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Griffiths, and this is the show where we bring on those from the world of football to show you what it takes to be in the Eleven at the highest possible level. This week's guest was a standout for four years at Stanford, has plied her trade for multiple years now in the professional ranks in the NWSL, and has been capped by her national team, but you know, as she shares, has, has had her setbacks as well, has had injuries, has had adversity that she's faced. And I, you know, I really had so much fun and, and learned so much from her about the professional game, her career, her mindset, her mentality, her approach to the game. And I know that you guys are going to as well. So I'm looking forward to kicking it over to our conversation, myself and Tegan McGrady, who is in the 11 this week. Before I do that, if you love the show, if you love the In the 11 podcast, and you love what we are about, I would encourage you and you want to support it just that little bit extra, check out down below, patreon.com slash in the 11 pod. You get the access to the episodes a day before anybody else does, and it helps the show grow, and it supports us just a little bit more as we do what we are trying to do. Without further ado, let me kick it over to myself and Tegan. All right, ladies and gentlemen, stepping into the 11 now and joining us this week is Tegan McGrady, currently taking some time off from uh, what I imagine a busy off season of training and, and lots of things going on. So I appreciate you taking the time and looking forward to hear a little bit about your story. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Maybe if you want to kick us off there, what is a kind of typical off season like uh, for you? What, what does it sort of look like? Um... I mostly spend my off time home in San Jose, California with my family. Um, it kind of changes based year to year and where I'm at, but yeah. most of the time I'm here mostly in San Jose. Um, can't really beat the weather in California for winter time, so I always try and get back to the warmth for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, I take off quite a bit of time and then slowly kind of get back into things. So. Uh, past couple of weeks have kind of just been like a prep phase, about three, three to four trainings a week, and now starting to get more into a loading phase um, again. So working my way slowly back onto the field and kind of just, you know, in physical therapy for certain things, just kind of fine tuning different things so I don't have problems arise as preseason starts. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned there that sometimes it kind of depends season to season what, you know, your situation is and, and what's going on. Right. And, and I'm, when speaking to players, I kind of find that there's sort of two off seasons, right? There's this off season where you kind of know what you're going, where you're going to next and the, and the plan's already mapped out for you and you can just focus on the training and the rehab. And then there's the off season where things are a little bit kind of unsure and we're trying to figure out what that next landing spot is going to be. Is that kind of a fair assessment of sometimes the, the mental state of an off season? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think uh, last off season was a little bit more of in the middle up in the air was traded. So didn't really know exactly what um, I was going into. And this year have a little bit more of structure going back to um, the team that I was already at. So I think, yeah, very differently each way that it goes and both, you know, are challenging. But I think the best is to kind of just know and have like a roadmap for yourself, even if there's nothing like in plan or in store for you. Um, just something to kind of keep your focus on and, you know, keep working towards that. Yeah, I was just about to ask you how, how important is that, you know, because when you're in the season, oftentimes many things are structured out for you, you know exactly when training is going to be and, and matches and travel days and all those things. And sometimes in the off season, especially when you don't know where you're going next, there can sometimes be a tendency to not have that structure and feel a little bit lost and then how to figure it out, right? So how important is that for you? Like you talked about, okay, I map my trainings out like this and I have my, you know, my PT days and all those types of things. Yeah, I think the the key thing to it is just being able to be flexible and adaptable, which almost kind of helps you during season and whatnot. But um, I know that I'm in a good place at home. So I think like Mm -hmm. the number one thing for you is like figuring out that your environment is like the best environment for you to be in to rest, recharge and get ready to, you know, do what you have to in season. So from there, I kind of just, you know, map out my surroundings, what I know I have, what I know that. I kind of need and then from there I kind of start setting my schedule based on um, just like the environment that I'm in so if I you need need to go lift at a certain place a couple days a week 
and the only time slots that I'm working with people are like certain times, then I kind of have to base things around that. So it's more just being flexible. I mean, it, it's also hard because, you know, you want to take vacation. Yeah. And, you know, I've already done that once and I'm going to do it one more time, maybe even a third time just because you <laughs> need like all the breaks that you get because you don't really get it during season Yeah. as much as you'd like. But just even then, like, you know, I was in San Diego last week um, for an entire week and had to find like a gym to go to. So I think it's just making sure you know your surroundings and being flexible and being open um, to continuing to work, even though your environment may change from week to week. Yeah. Because is there, even on those vacations, is there ever really like a, a complete disconnect from soccer? You know, like you said, you want to have that time where you can just kind of check out and just go enjoy the beach or go enjoy something that's not related to a soccer ball. But sometimes I feel the way as if many athletes brain works is like it's always kind of in the back of their head. Like, uh, when was the last time I worked out? or When was the last time I trained? Yeah, I'd say like really the only main time that I'll take like, you know, full time off from running training lifting any of that is right after season is over for a couple of weeks but other than that if I if I want to take a vacation somewhere still closer to season time I have to make sure that I have a place and a limit within that I can you know that's within reach so I can continue to yeah. work and do what I need I you know a lot of us always say like where there's a will there's a way so you know no matter what vacation you go on if you want to keep continuing to work towards preseason, then you got to find a way to get the other stuff done also. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you've spoken here, you've talked a lot about that environment, like whatever environment you're in, is it is it kind of supportive of you doing, mm -hmm. achieving your goals, right? And maybe if we take it back a little bit, was that home base for you a really important factor and you kind of falling in love with the game of soccer and, and developing a passion for the game and wanting to compete at such a high level from a young age? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, I always feel best around my family. I, I grew up a big family person. I still am. A lot of people, even myself, I'll call myself kind of a homebody. Mm. Um, if I can be home, that's really where I'm at. Um, and it just kind of brings me back to my days. I mean, my parents are in the same house that I, you know, grew up in most of my life and even the same house as when I went to Stanford. So mm -hmm. it's always like a place that I can come back to that I know, um, whatever it is, I'm, I'm going to be able to get things done. And I think growing up, it was always so nice having this place of support and love no matter what that, you know, my parents and siblings were always behind me pushing me to be the best that I can so it it's a safe place I call it like my safe place my home yeah. I have many homes that I live or many homes that I've moved to but yeah. this is definitely like my safe place. so um, I always come back to it no matter how many times I leave <laughs> yeah absolutely so what kind of sparked soccer as a you know as a youngster, what sparked that being the sport that you sort of fell in love with and then obviously wanted to kind of push to the highest level you could? Yeah, so I mean, I kind of started out when I was probably younger than most, at around three years old, just because I have an older sister. Um, my mom was coaching her team in soccer, so I kind of would just was out there on the field with her no matter what. And then mm -hmm. as soon as I could get into my own playing, I did, which was around four was the first team that I ever joined. And you know, just a little rec soccer, but I think because of my older sister and my mom had also played soccer was I was just always on the field. It wasn't just two days a week. It was four or five days a week because my sister always had practice too, um, which kind of helped me. I was always a little bit on the smaller side. I'm not, you know, the biggest player. I'm five six now, which is a, a good height, but I was always on the smaller end when I was younger. So I always played up a year in my age group and then I'd always train with my sister's team who's yeah. um around two to three years older than me so I was always playing with you know bigger kids and so that always helped and my mom coached both my team and you know my sister's team so I you know really wanted to follow that I love the sport a lot and you know I played a lot of other ones also when I was younger um I love basketball um, I played tennis and I ran track in high school and soccer was kind of always just the one that I loved the most. Um, it gave me a freedom out there that, you know, I just loved. I loved every aspect of the game and I loved more learning more and more. And I feel like 
soccer is a sport that kind of keeps on giving. I yeah. asked my dad at a young age to, you know, buy all the soccer channels on TV when it, you know, <laughs> the wasn't included in the big TV packages yet. I would wake yeah. up on Saturday, Sunday morning, watch any type of soccer that I could find. Um, and I think that's like mostly how I kind of fell in love with it is I just wanted you know every bit of part of it even if it was you know teams that I had no idea were on the team when yeah. you know I was watching it up but I just I wanted to solely watch soccer it was you know I thought it was so cool I'm more of uh I've always been big and like vision in the game so I think mm. like watching it made me love it that much more um you know I can I like seeing things on the field before they happen I love reading the game so I think watching it just like really was like my biggest thing even now I mean I watch soccer all the time so even when I'm in you know town or something and my coach has my old club coach I'm super close with him I always train with him when I come back to San Jose his younger teams if they have games I'll go out and like help him or I'll watch or something so I always love watching the game and I think that was just more like it's always been able to speak to me it was my outlet when I was younger um so yeah I think I've always just kind of loved it and then around 10 or 11 is when I started playing competitively Mm -hmm. and that was kind of like when I really started to ramp up um I would go to Stanford soccer games my grandma would take me um and my parents and I think that's kind of like where I fell in love with Stanford too um I would go to a bunch of Stanford sporting events and so at age 10 or 11 I said for the first time that I wanted to go to Stanford, it was my dream to play soccer there and then to go on to play professionally. So um, I kind of set my goals at a very, yeah. very young age. <laughs> so. Wow, that's a that's incredible, though, that kind of manifestation as a as a 10 year old to set your sights at that. And now, you know, as you look back at it, <laughs> who knows that that yeah. that 10 year old is actually right. Uh it's uh, it's interesting though that you mentioned about watching the game as well because I was going to ask you. It sounds like that was a bit of your inspiration for like seeing those players on TV and then being like, all right, I want to do what they're doing. And I don't know if you have much experience with like coaching a lot of youth players and stuff, but I know some players that I speak to, um, you know, I'll ask them if they watch games, and some do, and and some just mm-hmm. don't at all. And it's always such a fascinating thing because I think exactly what you just said it really opens up your eyes to the way the game is played. And, you know, if you watch what the best players do, maybe you try and kind of imitate them a little bit or, or do some of the things that they do and have success success with. So I think it's a, a super valuable tool that hopefully lots of young players continue to do. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I mean, I grew up watching, you know, Barcelona was one of the best teams, obviously, when I was growing up. Um and I'm a defender. I loved watching Danny Alves play when he was still at Barcelona. So that was like mm-hmm. a big person for me. And then Jordi Alba being another amazing outside back. So it was like the more that I watched, the more that, like you said, I wanted to imitate the players on the field, the more that I got out of it. I was also one of the lucky, you know, kids growing up that had the San Jose Cyberays around for the women's team that I got to go and watch, you know, games when I was younger. So I had that you know, sight set on a professional team from a very young age, which a lot of people or a lot of, you know, kids in general for women didn't get growing up. So I think yeah. that was help too. So I think, you know, I love being able to uh, give back when I can, especially the communities, which is why I go out to my club team and or my old club all the time and in the off season and mm-hmm. see the players, get to know them, train with them if I can sometimes, because I think it just helps so much having it firsthand in front of you and being able to see it um, no matter what. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and can you take me through then a little bit kind of then you, you fall in love with the game and you're watching it all the time. And is there kind of a, a moment where you realize, okay, if I want to get there, like I'm going to have to do a lot more than the other players are doing. Like maybe take me a little bit through that mindset of kind of as a young player understanding like, how I'm going to actually get to that goal that I have for myself, you know, Stanford and pro and all those things. Yeah. I think you, you know, said something interesting there where it's like, I'm going to have to do, you know, more than other players. And I don't think I really thought that way. I think it was more Mm. just like, I continue to push myself in certain ways in order to get where I want to be that it was necessarily not about other players. I, I kind of had this confidence and like knew in myself that like if I put in the work and the time and effort to do it, then like it will happen. Like no one else is going to stop me to from doing that. The only person that's going to stop me is me. 
And, yeah. you know, like I said, I had a very supportive system growing up. So my parents would, you know, drive me to the extra trainings that I needed. And, you know, if I wasn't going to extra trainings, it would sometimes be just doing things outside in the yard, like juggling. I wasn't great at when I was younger. Still not amazing at, but, <laughs> you know, I did what I needed to at that point. If I didn't have training, then I'd say, okay, let me go out in the front yard and do it because, you know, there are some training sessions growing up that coaches would be like, if you can't juggle the ball a hundred times with your feet, like you're going to be on the side of training until that happens. So I was like, I'm, that's not happening to me. I'm, I'm going to go out and make sure that happens. You know, yeah. every day I'm going to make sure I get to that point. So, um, yeah, I think it's kind of just having to, you know, ask yourself the question of like how good you really want to be and like what you're willing to do. Yeah. willing to do in order to make it to that point and um I think other sports definitely helped me like I played basketball all the way until high school but you know a lot of the things that I did in basketball I was you know not the best at shooting not the best at dribbling but like my defensive skills like helped a lot and that yeah. honestly helped me in soccer like moving my feet and getting myself in front of players um you know playing tennis helped my side to side movements track made me fit and fast yeah. so it was all things that you know it wasn't just me at the soccer field every single day you know seven days a week putting in work I know that's how some people do make it but I think it's you know figuring out the best ways for yourself um to continue to work and work hard and make sure that that work is coming out in some way and helping you so I think it's just identifying like what you need most and then making mm. sure that you're getting after it when you do yeah and and when did you start to kind of, right, because you set that goal for yourself and then you're like, okay, I know what I need to sort of start to stack on, on top of itself to get closer and closer. When did you start to kind of realize like, oh, all right, I think like this goal is really within within reach. Like I, I think, you know, when was the first kind of couple moments where you started to realize like I'm a good player and I can play, you know, and, and play at all these levels? You know, I I feel like it was – you know, a little bit different, you know, for me growing up, maybe even in the time frame that I end, but we had so many different things to like compare ourselves to. So like I had ODP growing up. Yeah. So like growing up and making it to like, you know, the state and then the regional level. And like, you know, I went to this massive regional camp and got picked over a bunch of other players. I'd be like, oh my gosh, like I, I can I can do this like I'm being picked over players that you know I play against in club that I think do really well or I'm playing with these players I think a lot of the times especially in Northern California you get um compared to like Southern California girls and playing mm -hmm. because they're supposed to be the best in the nation and so when you make the regional team with you know these players that are supposed to be amazing you you see yourself as a two and you're like wow like I'm I'm supposed to be here like this is a spot that I can get to and then getting to a youth national team like I didn't have much confidence in myself and I was told that at one of my first youth national team camps like you just you just didn't have it and I was like but I know I have it like I don't hmm. like how did that not happen I didn't have a first a good first camp and I said that next time I got a chance if I got a chance like I was going to make it known that I should be there hmm. and didn't get called into the but the one after it happened to get called into and, you know, being told that it was night and day, like they could tell that I had confidence finally. And like, I mm. think it's just you knowing, like once you know that you can, like there's not much that can get in your way except for, like I said, like yourself. And it's hard. It's a, a hard thing to do. I still struggle with confidence issues yeah. and, you know, I've been most everything in, you know, my career so far. And it's a hard thing. It's some days you'll do great at and some days you won't do great at. But knowing and reminding yourself every day, you know, you can have a bad training. You can have a bad game. Those things are going to happen. Um, but just knowing who you are and going back to, like, the main things that you know how to do and you know what to do best and make you the player that you are, the things that make you who you are. Um would be like my best advice to give. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to talk about the, uh, uh, their national team experience for sure. Um, but I think you bring up such an important point about that confidence, right? And it's, it's so 
it's fascinating and it's but it's also a little bit refreshing to hear it from like a pro player at the top level to say like yeah I still struggle with confidence to this day because I think a lot of younger players just think that those players get to that elite level and they can you know they can do everything and and they don't they don't think about you know making mistakes or, or being or performing not up to their standard and it's true even at the highest levels like people make mistakes and they struggle with their ability to kind of to kind of fit into a team and and feel and wonder where their status is sort of like and I know you gave some good advice in there like what would you kind of say to that player maybe a younger player that like even in a game right if they make a mistake you know a lot of players will think oh my gosh I've just made a mistake how am I gonna make the next play and and often as you can attest to I'm sure it's like if you're thinking about the mistake you just made you're really putting yourself already in a tough spot to go and and make the next play. Yeah, I think it's it's hard. It's something that I had to learn over time, but um, the same club coach that I continue to train with now, I always keep his voice in the back of my head. And when you know I make a mistake on the field or something's not going right for me, the first thing I remember is just get your next touch right. Don't mm. try and do anything fancy. Don't overthink things. Just first touch, make one good pass. That's it. Just find a simple, easy pass. You find that simple, easy pass, then you can maybe think about next time, you know, maybe another touch and another simple pass. Just do the things in the game that are the simplest. Mm. And the more that you simplify the game, the more confidence that you'll get in yourself. And you'll be like, okay, like I can pass a ball. I can touch a ball. Not everything you do is wrong. We're going to make mistakes in the game. But as long as you simplify the game and you're you know, trying your hardest and you're doing the small things, then the big things will come. But if you immediately try and start with big things and you get negative a negative mindset, you're going to continue to mess up. So that's something that I always do. I mean, I had an own goal this last year in San Diego and, you know, it was passing back to my keeper. It was miscommunication, but we had been, you know, winning one, nothing in angel city. It's now tied. We should be, you know, beating them at this point. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. And I just had to think I was having, you know, a good game at that point. And I was like, how did that happen? Like I'm having a great game. And I was like, you got to let it go. You got to, you know, mm-hmm. you get one second to look up at that board and rewatch this goal. And the next thing is, is you got to go again. The next pass that you get, just make a simple, easy pass. Get yourself back into this game. Make sure you're calm. Get those nerves to go away. It happens. We have to realize that things happen in the game all the time. I mean, we all just watch this World Cup and watch how many players make mistakes. And these are your best players in the world. Yeah, It's going to happen. And it's just about how you bounce back from those mistakes and how you can show that, okay, I did this, but let me simplify and let me do this. And then let's try something more than that. And then you keep going from there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, I would love to ask you, like you, you know, you play with some of the play with and against some of the top players in the world. And do you notice, is that seem to be kind of a common trait that everyone has is you know, I, I, as we mentioned, everyone maybe struggles with confidence, but there's a certain kind of mental fortitude that a lot of players at that top level have in order to be able to bounce back. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, you know, I feel like a lot of the time what separates, you know, the highest players to the next level is just like, you're like mentally, like, what can you, you know, do? Like, can you turn a bad situation into a good, how can you keep yourself in a game when you think that you might be, losing it how do you do the things in the hardest situations that other people you know might not be able to do yet and I think that's like a big one whether it's you know saying you simplify I know some players that they make a mistake and they say okay fine the next tackle that I go into is going to be to crunch someone right now because that's the way that I get my mindset back like what am I going to do to make myself feel good in the game again and I know people that will do that you know it's not fun to go against them because if you're that person (laughs) that they crunch it hurts but it's just you know this mentality side of like I don't know what it is for me it's simplifying the game for another player it's putting in a tackle for another player it's hitting you know let me just clear this ball out so I know that I can clear a ball again and go from there but Mm -hmm. there's got to be something that allows you to snap out of you know a type of mentality that gets you in a negative mindset like what's going to be that one thing and you know a lot of our people that I've played with it's just someone instead of yelling at them saying like hey like next one like it's not a yeah 
it's not like, a, oh, it's okay. Like next time it's like a, I'm going to tell you firmly next one, but you probably know that you already messed up. So we don't need to yell at you yeah. and make you feel bad. You know, how do we motivate each other and yourself without keeping that negative mindset going? How do we get you back into this positive mindset? Yeah. Yeah. I imagine you kind of already were starting to get exposed to some of that kind of elite level mentality, even with some of those youth national team camps and seeing some of those players who had those same aspirations as you to go um, to the pro level. And, and a lot of us, you know, we understand what it's like to play club or to play college soccer, but can you just like kind of put into words, like what's the difference when, you know, you put on that badge for, the the u.s team and and i have to imagine there's just a different aura kind of around whether it be camp or you know matches or whatever no it for sure is like it's it's a different feeling um one of my youth national team coaches growing up was always like it is you know it's a privilege for you to be wearing this badge right now like this is a privilege that you know you're being granted like don't mess it up don't but don't think anything more of it too. Like you're here for a reason, but also like, don't let it get to your head that you're here, that you're wearing this badge, but like you need to fight for it because there are plenty of people that wish they were sitting in your spots right now. So, you know, you can't let it get to your head that you're in this big stage, but you also have to fight for everything that's there for it. Um, So I think it's, you know, it's one of those, it's, it's hard to describe just because it's just like an in the moment type feeling. It's a really proud, it's, you know, just like a, wow, like I, I made it to this point. I mean, I have one cap, so not many, but it's a lot more than most can say. And I'm super grateful for that, that one cap, whether that be my last one or more to come. Um, Mm -hmm. it's always hard to say in this sport, but you know, always be proud of that. And, you know, that was always a dream for for me as little girls to just you know get to that full team yeah and if it's that one time I'm always going to be proud of myself for that and I'm you know so grateful for that experience and opportunity to be have been able to to do it so it's just a different a different level a different experience yeah how how special was it as well obviously now being in at the pro level and I'm sure in college as well you got to travel kind of all over the country through playing this game did you also have experiences for that some of your first times maybe traveling internationally as well whether it be youth national team or senior team yeah for sure I mean youth national team is where I did most of my international traveling just because I was on the U17 team so we traveled a lot to different places we had you know a camp in England um we had a camp in Spain we had two camps in Costa Rica we had a camp in Jamaica Um, so I think it, you know, it's all the places that you would hope for your job or somewhere to take you and, you know, some of the best experiences that I've ever had going on those trips. And, you know, even, even in the pros, like we don't go internationally, but, you know, to be able to go to so many places in the U S that I probably would have never thought to, like everyone always asked me how Washington DC was when, you know, I lived there and played there. And I was like, you know what, like, I never would have moved across the country on my own. You would have never seen me moving across the country. I love the West Coast. I love California. And through and through, I want, that's where I want my life to be. Mm -hmm. But having that experience of going to DC was such a blessing in disguise. And I'm so happy that I got the chance to experience the East Coast and DC and do the things that I would have never forced myself to do. Um, you know, I, I look back to all my memories there and I, I absolutely love it. A lot of my best friends still play on that team mm-hmm. and it was, it was hard leaving. Um, but I was also so excited to get back to the West coast. So like, yeah, I was totally okay with it, but I was really happy that it happened just because, you know, soccer will take you to all the places, um, without you really understanding and, you know, then living in San Diego now up in Portland, like I told myself, I was like, okay, like, there couldn't have been three different places that you could have picked to live in the U S in a span of a couple of years. Like how else would you have done that besides soccer? And so I'm, I'm yeah, super grateful for the national team and for soccer for, you know, letting me explore 
in other areas of my life that I would have never thought to if it weren't for soccer. Yeah. Isn't it funny how like this love of the sport kind of in a way pushes you outside of your comfort zone? Because, you know, I even speak to players who go to all sorts of crazy places around the world, you know, playing in Slovenia and Kazakhstan and, mm -hmm. and places like you said, I would never, ever pick there to just go and live um, if I if I wasn't actually, you know, chasing this little soccer ball. So it's funny how it's like, you know, you, you love mm -hmm. your family and you love that West Coast life. But there's this one thing. It's like if the ball is going to take me there, I might just have to follow it <laughs> to all these different places around the country. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I I love it. And there's times where I'm like, oh, like traveling again. And then I'm like, I'm I'm really lucky to do all this traveling, to do all these things. Um, soccer definitely takes you out of your comfort zone, but it gives back so much at the same time. So it's always great. Absolutely. So what was then the process of kind of being recruited by Stanford and, and really realizing that was going to be the dream was going to be fulfilled and you were going to get to go to uh, to Stanford and play? Yeah, so I mean, I feel like it's definitely changed these years now too. So I started being recruited like eighth grade, freshman year of high school um, wow. by Stanford. And that was a little bit earlier just because I lived in the area. So it was really easy for their coach to see me play. Um, and the, I played for MVLA, so Mount View Los Altos, which is like 10 minutes down the road from Stanford. So it was super easy for them to see me play. And then, you know, I was looking at other schools too, but my great grandfather also went to Stanford and ran track there. So mm -hmm. it was a little bit more of a legacy thing for me that I, I knew that I wanted to go there. Grew up going to all the sporting events. It was just a special place for me from the get go. But I ended up committing my, I verbally committed my sophomore fall of high school to Stanford, which wow. was the earliest in our class. Um, but for me, you know, people always ask, like, you weren't scared that, like, you were making a wrong decision. You weren't, you know, scared that you would change your mind or, like, something would happen and you wouldn't end up getting in or, like, you don't think it'd be easier if you just, you know, waited a little bit. And I was like, no, like, I, I know I want to go to Stanford and this now gives me, you know, a straight road plan ahead of what I want and how I, what I need to do in order to achieve that goal. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I could have picked other school that you know is also just as great as soccer but maybe a little bit easier getting in school wise and I was like if I leave those two doors open and somehow I slip grade wise like I'm just settling for something because I wasn't able to get into Stanford I was like I want to make a decision because I know that I can do it not because I can't do it anymore so I was like I'm I'm going to get into Stanford and they're mm. like, and I was like, you know, I'll have a backup just in case, but like, I, I don't need that backup. Like I can, I can do it. I put my head down in high school. I took a lot of AP classes. I, <laughs> you know, had to send in my courses every, you know, some, or every year to the college coach and he would take it over to admissions to make sure that, you know, I was on the right track and you know, senior year when everyone else is having a good time taking, you know, four or five classes that are, you know, all fun classes, you know, I'm here yep. taking three AP classes and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what did I get myself <laughs> into? I, I knew it was, it was all for a reason. So, you know, I, I committed that early just because I knew that like, I'm, I'm a big planner. I love planning things. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a fun fact. So I, I knew that by deciding that it was going to give me that like, you know, straight road that said, this is the way that you get there. There's no other routes. You got to go through all of this in order to do that. And I was like, and I said, okay, like I'm, I'm going to do, it. it's going to be a lot. You know, there's sacrifices I'm going to make that, you know, might hurt now, but in the long run, I'm going to be happy that I made those sacrifices. I mean, there were even with national team stuff. I mean, like I said, I was going through, U17 national team at that time and we were getting ready mm -hmm. for a World Cup qualifier and I think my junior year I missed like 70 something days of school oh I was in and out yeah. and you know there's times where I go online to look at my grades and I'd be slipping into like C's and D's because I just wasn't there and I just hadn't turned in work and I was like oh my gosh like how am I going to do this like 
you know, we had uh, my parents, like I said, all the support. Once again, I have to give to my parents and my family, you know, give, you know, hiring physics tutors for me, you know, for when I am home to help me get all my work done. My Mm -hmm. grandma traveling to Jamaica, obviously to see me play, but, you know, helping me on, you know, the days where, you know, some girls would kind of know that they're basically already into their school. They'd be on the beach in Jamaica having a good time. I'd be in the lobby sitting with my grandma doing Spanish, you know, Spanish homework, trying to make sure that I was doing the thing. So, you know, even through it all with soccer, I think I had to, with because of soccer, I think I missed, you know, a couple homecomings, different yeah. dances, different reasons to be gone. And, you know, at the time I was just would get so mad and so upset sometimes and be like, why does soccer always have to take these things away from me? Mm. And then I look at it now and I'm like, you know, like it, it sucks to sacrifice things. But I think that's like another big thing that you have to realize, like if you want to make it to the level that you're at, like sacrifices have to be made. And, you know, at, at that time when you're in high school, you know, homecomings, like, Oh, you got to yeah. go to homecoming. And so yeah. that was like the hardest thing to give up when you're in high school. It was, you know, things that you wanted to do with your friends, wanting to stay out late on the weekends or wanting to do certain things. And I just didn't really do those things. But I, you know, sacrificed those things for a reason. Because when I got to Stanford, you know, those are probably some of the best years of my life that I've ever had. I, all of my best friends, you know, mm-hmm. I met at Stanford. And even though I didn't really fit into high school as much as I wanted to, I figured out that reason why and it was because my people were more at Stanford than anyone else. And I sacrificed things in high school to make sure that I went to the place that I knew that I fit in best to. And so it's a journey and it takes a lot out of you, but it also is so rewarding at the end of the day when you make those decisions that you know are based, you know, solely off of what you think are best for you. Yeah. Was that maybe that first time for you where, kind of maybe for the you know the outsider looking in they see they're like wow like committed to Stanford you know playing for the national team getting to travel all over um and as you mentioned there it's it's amazing but everything comes with pros and cons right nothing can be absolutely perfect and and so there were different social things you had to give up and also you know yes you're traveling to Jamaica but also you're trying to write an English paper and study for a physics test the moment that you get back was that maybe that first kind of exposure to that where it was like okay like there's so many rewards here and this is going to be amazing and even you know we can even speak about it at the pro level too like being a professional is awesome it's it's you know the best job in the world but it's not perfect it has its it has its own flaws just like anything and there is a certain level of social life that you maybe have to give up or like you said once that season starts for you there's no there's no PTO there's no like <laughs> hey coach I'm going to go take a vacation like it doesn't work yeah. like that so is that like, you kind of realize that, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old, like, okay, I love this, but it's going to take a little bit of giving some things up. Yeah, for sure. I remember, I forget which national team camp it was, but someone, or maybe it was me or someone was going to be missing something. And our coach had us in for a meeting and he was like, these aren't, these are the easiest decisions you're going to have to make. And we all just looked at each other like, what deciding between homecoming and camp like that's not an easy decision and like yeah. <laughs> now I look back and I'm like that was by far the easiest decision I have ever had to make and you know really making those decisions sacrifices get you ready for you know the decisions that you're gonna have to make now I mean the decisions that I've had to make in the past couple years with soccer and going places and you know do I do I go overseas do I stay in the U.S. do yeah. I you know do I take this trade do I not like what what is going to be the best for my career down the road and those are some of the hardest choices that I've had to make and now I look back on my high school decisions and I'm like wow I wish I had those decisions to make again <laughs> I, think, I think that's like a big thing is like you don't realize it when you're younger but I look back now and I'm like I'm I'm so glad that I had to make those decisions because you know it, it's not that it makes any e- decision easier yeah. Now, but it made me realize that, you know, deep down, like most of the time, I'll know which one is right or wrong. Whether or not, you know, it makes me happy or it upsets me, I most of the time know which one I need to do for myself. And it makes it only easier in the way of like, I can see that, like, because of the decisions that I've made in the past, 
that things have worked out for me, that things, you know, are where I want them to be now, that making a hard decision might be better for you down the road. And now I understand that better than I did when I was younger. So it's not that the decisions are easier to make. They're just as hard, Mm. um, if not harder, but it's easier to know that down the road, there's always some sort of good that that comes from it. I, I remember I was talking to my family this year um, when my trade from San Diego to Portland was going through. And I was like, I was, you know, I was, I was upset just because I loved my life down in San Diego and I didn't realize that I'd be leaving so soon. And I was like, I, I was like, I know this is, this is hard. I was like, that's, you know, it's gut wrenching to have to leave like this. And I was like, I don't know the reason why right now. I was like, but I hope that I find out that reason later. Um, and I remember, you know, specifically telling my parents that in tears, packing everything up, leaving San Diego, just being like, I, I just so desperately want to know that reason already, but I know that I can't know it now. Like, I just have yeah. to wait for it and I'll come to the end of the year, end up, end up winning. So I'd say that was basically a good reason why. So I think it just all kind of works itself out in time. And that's something that I've that I've learned and it's really hard to say that to someone especially too when they're making those decisions but it's it's the truth and you might not know why but it will come out sooner or later yeah and and it seemed like as you kind of hit on before that first realization that 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 process worked of making those hard decisions and having the reward was that experience that you had at Stanford where it sounds like kind of everything was clicking, right? School, location, football, you know, friends as well. Like, was that kind of the, I'm sure there's obviously ups and downs to it as well. But overall, as you as you kind of characterize that time at Stanford, how special is that as you look back? Um, So special, definitely, you know, some, like I said, some of the best years of my life there. Um, I always like to think of it as this way. I'm like, wow, it took me longer to like, almost longer to get into that school than I was actually there for. (laughs) So like I'm there feels like it flew past compared to how long it took me to get in. Um, So, I mean, it it was great. That definitely had its, it has its rough patches. I think every place does. I think everyone will have that rough time. And, you know, I'm, it it was an all sunshine and rainbows. I thought after my sophomore year, maybe I was going to stop playing. I, I just, I lost a spark and it was, it was scary. And, I went through a lot of, you know, sports psychology through that off season to try and figure out like, maybe this just isn't for me anymore. Maybe I'm just in a, in a low right now. And, um, it was hard, especially because after that sophomore year was when we lost Santa Clara in double overtime in the second round, which we were supposed to win it all that year. We were, that was, was supposed to be one of the best teams that we had during my time at Stanford. And so I was like, wow, like you know, wasn't my best season. Um, it was a hard, hard season, had just come back from surgery and somehow played almost the entire season. Um, but just kind of felt like I had let my team down. I think a lot of the team kind of felt that way. Um, especially because the seniors on the team at that time, everyone loved them. So, you know, we just wanted to do it for them and not getting it done for them was really hard. But yeah, after that time, I was like, I don't, I don't know. I think I was, I had talked about the sports thing about this, but like I was, you know, this was one of those confidence things. I was like, I was so scared of failing again because this yeah. really felt, felt like my, my big fail, you know, since high school when we didn't make it to the U17 World Cup and lost in qualifiers and PKs after, so after that I was devastated, but then, you know, I bounced back at Stanford, but losing in that second round game my sophomore year really felt like the biggest failure that I had gone through in a long time. And I was like, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just done. Like, I don't, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I don't want to fail like this. And now I'm scared. Now I'm scared. I'm not going to, you know, reach my dreams that I wanted to. Maybe it's time for me to explore other things outside of soccer. And there's this other side of me saying like, oh, like, let's just go be a regular student. Let's just Mm -hmm. go and have not have to put in the time and work that all these athletes have to put in because that seems like a lot more fun than what you're doing right now feeling like this day in and day out you know feeling like you had failed you know your teammates your coach your school all these things yeah and went through a lot of went through a lot of psychology and you know 
battled my way back and that's when I came out to have you know one of my best seasons and that's when I got called into the national team that next year to the full team so I think you know like I said things happen for a reason and you have to go through these lows to get to your highs and you know just battling through the lows and knowing that it's going to be okay at the end of the day is probably one of the biggest things that you have to learn how to do if you want to get to the level that you want to be at. Do you ever find common ground with whether it be, you know, teammates in college or teammates even now at the pro level in having sort of an experience like you had where maybe there was a thought of like, do I still want to keep doing this or like that fear of failure? Like, I'm curious just because like, I know that a lot of players I've talked to have that kind of moment where they're like, all right, there's two roads to kind of go here. (laughs) And, and the one is looks a little bit harder and the one looks a little bit easier. And, and so I'm wondering if you have those kind of same maybe conversations or other connections with, with teammates that you've had. Yeah, for sure. I would say, you know, just about everyone that I've played with that I, you know, have deeper connections with and we talk about these kind of things for sure. Everyone, everyone has their moments of being like, like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like this is, it takes everything out of you. And I'd say that's like a big common ground in our sport and what we do. And even as professional athletes, like there's all the glory that everyone else sees, all the sunshine Mm -hmm. and rainbows that everyone else sees in the sport that we do. But, you know, no one sees the true, you know, grit and what it takes every single day, you know, day in and day out. And, you know, you see, especially like going to season, you know, especially when you have, you know, all your friends who don't play anymore and you see them going on trips every weekend when they don't have work and people are taking their vacations in the summertime or, you know, people are going to the lake for a long weekend and you're like, well, I don't get that Monday off because we don't have those days or, oh yeah, we're doing this, like wish you could come or like any of like, you know, just the big walks of life, like going to festivals, going to all these different things you're like we don't we don't get those opportunities and a lot of the times those weekends we normally sulk with each other and we're like oh like we wish we could be doing this right now but of course we can't it's like we all know whether we talk about it all the time or not Mm. I think it's definitely you know when someone's going through it you can kind of tell and especially as teammates we're there to pick each other up when those when those things do happen a lot of the times if not we can tell by the way that we act near each other, or you have your close confidants on the team that you'll talk to about it. And believe it or not, just about every single player on every team probably goes through that once a season where they're like, wow, like this sucks. Like this, yeah. this is not fun to go through. But I think because we all have that understanding of it, that it's going to be a thought and that it's okay for it to be a thought, then we all can help each other through it a lot more than just going through it on your own. Um, So that's always really nice to like have teammates to be able to talk to about it and know that you can go through a funk and, you know, a couple bad weeks and even the coaches, even everyone knows that it's not, you can't be, it would be silly to think that every player could be a hundred percent every single week through a 10 month season. You're just not going to get it. It's hard. There's ups and downs. And that's why they always say, you know, the team at the end of the year that has the least amount of injuries and the one that has the best, you know, energy and chemistry going forward. And they're all clicking at the same time and everyone's up at the same time. And it's normally the team that comes out on top. It's, it's always, you know, a toss up at the end of the season, but it's, it's what team is clicking, what team knows. And so that's why, you know, it's hard. You get burnt out at sometimes during the season, but you know, it's, it's part of it. And you just got to keep working through it and you got to lean on the people next to you. Yeah. Yeah. I would even venture a guess to say it's, it seems as if the beginning of your professional career, you know, after being drafted and kind of having that high moment and then, you know, boom, right away, it seems like COVID hits like the next moment. And then that season kind of gets turned upside down. And then I I read a little bit too, that you kind of struggled with some injuries in, in like your first like full rookie season and stuff. So I'm sure, you know, there's people that look at that from the outside and kind of see like, wow, you know, she's a professional and also like the team had success that year. But, you know, I think for anyone out there listening, like a lot of times there there's that moment where, you know, maybe a player is just coming back from surgery or they're kind of rehabbing completely on their own, isolated away from the team. 
Um, all those things are happening before you see that bright, shiny rainbow moment that you talked about where they're lifting a cup or they're, you know, lifting a trophy or something like that at the end of the season. What, what were those, that beginning kind of stage of professional life for you? Yeah, it was, it was hard. I mean, being drafted in, in the first round, you know, you're, a lot is expected of you. Um, and getting that injury that first season was was really hard. And it wasn't just one. It was, you know, the same injury third time over happened. Just quad was almost completely done for. And I think there was a two months, two to three months span where I didn't go to training at all. I was in physical therapy every single day for three, four, five hours. Yeah. Didn't see my teammates much at all. Um, only on the weekends if we had a home game. And if they were away, I really didn't see anyone at all on the weekend. So there's, you know, some weeks at a time where if my roommates, you know, my roommates were around, but I was in a dark spot sometimes my first season. It was hard just because I knew that I was supposed to do so much for that team in my first year and I was nowhere near it. I was mm. out 75% of the season. So it was, it was hard. I think it was a long look in the, in the mirror and once again, another moment where it was like, okay, like, you got to fight for this. You got to want it. And I remember them telling me the third time that I had done my quad, they're like, this is going to be about an eight to 12 week moving target of you getting back on the field. And I said, oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the long moving target. And that's not yeah, even mine like, you know, eight to 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, okay, well, you're not coming back before eight weeks. But who knows? You might not even be back by 12. We're unsure yeah. of how this is going to go. And I said, okay. But around the 12, 13-week mark was maybe second to last game of the season. So they were like, do we just want to call it and put you on the season-ending injury list? Or like it, it's basically up to you at this point. And I was like, no. I was like, I don't want to be put on that. I was yeah. like, I, I need to be able to make that my target whether you guys think I can make it back for games or not like if I can do it I need to get in a game by the end of the season to remind myself that I'm still that player that I can still be that player mm. if I shut it down for the, rest of the season I'm gonna be miserable like I'm gonna have to you know shut everything down for a while and I get why that might be the better thing to do just to give my time like my body time but like for my mentality and like my mindset, like we can't do that. I made it back in, like we said, moving target 13 weeks was when I played my first game again mm. and I got to play 30 minutes. And then the last game of the season, um, was actually in Portland. <laughs> Funny. It was my birthday weekend too. Hmm. And I got to play 45 minutes. I started, but I was really happy. I just, the one thing I wanted to do, I knew we weren't making playoffs was I just knew that I needed to play. Yeah. I knew that I needed to get on the field and show myself that I could do it, that it, I wasn't a lost cause, that this injury wasn't a lost cause, that, you know, there was hope and I wanted it to propel me through off season going into the next season. I didn't want to be, you know, scared to get back out on the field. I didn't want to be scared to strike a ball again all through the mm. off season before the next season. So that was one of the hardest, hardest years. I had ever gone through, you know, just injury wise and being out and, you know, I made it back. And then of course next year was COVID. So didn't get much time there, but <laughs> yeah. So yeah. can you hard. maybe like describe that? Because the, the reason I ask about like the injury process a little bit is like what you said was so important that, that kind of a lot of athletes, when they come back, then it's not just a like, all right, I'm healthy. Boom. I'm back out on the field and everything's perfect. Right. There sometimes can be a little bit of a mental block where you don't feel like you fully trust your body. Like I know mm -hmm. for me this past year, I had a bad uh, wrist break, like just got hit with a ball, freak accident, broke my wrist, had to have surgery plates in the whole nine yards. And like, I remember first of all, coming out of the surgery and kind of like, I couldn't even really like move my hand or my fingers at all. And I'm like, how is there ever going to be a point where I'm able to use my hand regular again? Like it didn't seem like yeah. I could find the path to where I was going to be healthy again. And then even too, like I'm back. Okay. I'm playing. 
And, you know, every time I'm going to block a ball, like I'm putting that hand behind my back because I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to get hit again. Yeah. I don't want to get hit in that wrist. Um, it sounds like for you, that was something that you really wanted to push past and like not have that, that fear, that trepidation with an injury. Yeah, for sure. I think that's like, like I said, it's one of the, one of the biggest sides of the game is the mental game. It's how you can get past things mentally and not so much physically. Mm. Um, you know that your body can do it at this point. Like, you know, you've been at a certain level. Like it's not the question of your body. It's the question of your mind. Can your mind do it at that point? Can your mind get past these roadblocks that have come into place? Because we know that your body can. Now it's just the head part of it. And, you know, it's all sports like from there too. I think a lot of it has to do with just like how you can train your mind to be able to go again and to be able to trust yourself. Because I remember after, you know, my biggest fear was striking a ball since that's how, you know, I had almost ripped my quad. And every time I go to strike a ball, I had like, you know, just not want to do it. I'd like do it, but I would like, you know, my trainer would be like, you're not putting full power into it. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm not like, <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to feel the pain in it. And even sometimes when I get ready to strike a ball harder, you know, it just replay in my head again, the time that I did it so badly. And I would like pull out of kicking the ball and they'd be like, what's going on with you? And I'm like, I just like, I don't know. Like, mm. they're like, your quad is okay. I was like, I know my quad's okay, but my head isn't like, my yeah. head isn't ready for this. I'm not ready for this because what if I do it again and I re injure myself all over again? Like I, I don't know how I'm going to get past this. And so it, it took a long time. Um, you know, it took them being patient with me. It took myself being patient with me and being able to just trust myself again. And, you know, it turned into, you know, scaling back, on striking and doing more in other ways so I could just they're like you know just trust yourself trust your body we don't have to strike or anything but like you know just at least like one ball today that's it I'd be like okay I can do that next day we'll go two balls this time okay like sounds good you don't even have to hit someone you can just hit into a net Mm. you know you can just stand you know like two yards out from the goal and just strike the ball. You don't even have to have like a target. You don't have to have someone that you're trying to find. And I was like, okay, sounds good. So I think it's just, it's hard. You you have to retrain yourself to to know that. And it's easier, way easier said than done, as you probably know. Yeah. It's just, it takes time, which is, you know, the second year part. Because you're like, you just want to get back into <laughs> it. But I don't think you realize that like when you get injured, it's not just you know, your leg or your foot or your wrist or your arm. It's your mind too. Yeah. And you have to be able to get past that point in order to trust yourself again and get your body to trust you. Um, so that part's really difficult. But that's why a lot of players, when they go through injuries, will have sports psychologists and everything because you can air out all your fears and worries, you know, in a very safe and comfortable space and then work on it. And, you know, figure out ways to trust yourself again and figure out ways for your body to trust you. Yeah, because there is a, a real mind body connection like that's that's true. Mm-hmm. And once you experience an injury, you'll understand that that sometimes your body feels OK, but your mind is kind of telling you something different that and it, yeah. it's just trying to protect you. And um, it, it sounds like as we kind of talked about your tenure with the with Washington, like there were so many different chapters, right? Like first adjusting to being a pro first year pro, like COVID injuries coming back from injuries. Like I know there was also some stuff that happened kind of with coaching front office, things of that nature. Like it it might be too broad to even say, but like, if you kind of look at that book, so many different chapters, like we said, is there even a a title that you can put on that Washington spirit kind (laughs) of, kind of saga (laughs) and a championship as well. I, I gather. Yeah. I, you know, people always ask me like, like how, and I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like <laughs> you know, a lot of people I've talked to would be like, you've experienced so far more in your couple, you know, four years that you've been in the league than anyone will ever experience being in this league, mm. being, you know, at a certain team, being traded, being traded again, like, you know, going through front office stuff at two different teams now. Yeah. You know, just going through injuries, different places. It, 
it's hard and I, you know, I hope it gets a little bit more smooth sailing from here, but part of me thinks there's no way that's going to happen because maybe that's just what my career has destined to be. Maybe it's just destined to be something that there's always some sort of chaos going on in it at some point. And I like to, you know, there was a girl on Portland where, you know, something would happen on another away, away trip and she'd be like, we are adaptable. And like this like funny <laughs> voice that we'd all just laugh at. So true. That's like, what most of your pro career is about is just being able to adapt. Like the more flexible and being able to adapt you are, the way farther you're going to be able to go. You're going to be able to know how to maneuver and navigate so many situations that you might not other like see in other, you know, realms of your life. So it's, you know, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm ready for just about anything that comes my yeah. way now, whether it be injuries, front office, you know, teams moving, you know, I moved every single year in the past four years of my life now. I'd like to think yeah. I'm at least good at packing now. Even oh, though for I don't sure. <laughs> but, you know, it's about getting my poor dog has had to move now. I don't know how many times he's like, Mom, are we ever just going to be in one place? I'm like, yeah, I, I hope so at some point. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, being adaptable and flexible are some of the biggest pieces of advice I can give, you know, just moving forward. Like the more you can do that, like the better off you're going to be. And I think that helps you not only in like the soccer world, but also just in the real world. Yeah. 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 Cause I would encourage any, you know, any person who's not in professional sports to just like, imagine somebody walks into your office one day, the job that you've been doing forever long. And it's just like, you've been traded and now you're going to go live in Minnesota and you have to be there next week. Like there's just, there's yeah. really nothing like it. And as you mentioned, you've already been through it twice. Like, can you kind of talk to me about the emotions? And, and obviously, you know, you mentioned the emotions of the dog where he's probably looking at you every time, like we're getting in the car, where are we going though? Like, are we just going to the park or are we going across the country? Like what's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it's really hard. And I, you know, I always, there's definitely like a difference between like off season trade and like in season trades. Yeah. I think my off season trade was obviously a little bit easier just because I wasn't in DC anymore. I was here at home in San Jose. I didn't have to go back to DC. All my stuff was packed up for me, um, which was really nice. But I think it's either way, it's it's one of those situations where you're trying to control so many different feelings and emotions at the same time. You're trying to be excited for a new place while also mourning another place. You're trying mm. to understand where you're leaving and closing a door, but also stepping through another one simultaneously. And that's where I'd say Washington, Washington DC to San Diego is a little bit easier just because I was already removed from it. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to a new place. I was going back to the West Coast. I was super excited for it. And I felt like a lot of what I did in Washington DC, like I was able to close that door easier um, just because I felt like I could I had done all that I could have there. Yeah. I made it through injuries. I adapted. I, you know, won a championship with my best friends. I did all these amazing things. I saw a different place. And so I was like, I feel, you know, I'm sad to close it, but I feel comfortable closing this door mm -hmm. and writing to, to this next one and, you know, be super open about where I'm going to. And, you know, San Diego is a beautiful, beautiful place. I was super excited. <laughs> And being there was so nice. And I think it was different just because everyone on the team was new to there. So, like, we all kind of had to start from a ground zero um, space, which was really nice. Yeah. It was fun. Uh, we all had to get to know each other on different levels in different ways. And then being traded from there to Portland was definitely, besides injuries, like, one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through in my career just because I was traded during – an international period during our week break, which didn't really feel like a break since I was being traded and didn't yeah. really have time to myself at that point to not think about soccer. <laughs> um, but I didn't really get to say bye to anyone there. Everyone was uh. on break. No one was there. So it was, you know, text after text when the news came through and I just was like, I was really sad. Um, I was really upset. I felt like business for me hadn't really been done there like yeah. I feel like I wanted more time I wanted to be able 
to show them why they should have, like, why I wanted them, you know, to keep me for longer. Um, but then I also was really excited because I knew that Portland really wanted me and I really wanted to be in a place that, you know, saw my value and saw who I was. And so, you know, I got into Portland, you know, within two, three, four day span time. And wow. I think I got there on a Sunday and we were leaving on that Wednesday for a game in Louisville. So I was like, and they're like, you're traveling. And I was like, Oh okay. my gosh. Like I, I practiced with the team once before I got on that trip and was like, I don't even know half of you. Like yeah. <laughs> I know everyone's name, but like I haven't talked more than five words to some of you. Like yeah. how be traveling with the team? And it was just Portland obviously is very different from San Diego. So I was, all these things at once. I'm trying not to compare the two places, but obviously I am just because I hadn't closed the door from San Diego yet. I feel like I didn't get my full closure there. Mm. So that door was still open. I stepped through the door to Portland and was like, okay, like, yeah, like I can do this and was like excited to be there. But you know, I was also turning her back around looking through this door to San Diego. That's still open. Yeah. And I was like, I I have to figure out a way to somehow close this door. And honestly, I don't think I really got full closure until San Diego came to Portland, um, you know, like a month or so later to play. And, you know, I got to see all my old teammates, got to, you know, talk to them, got to say, you know, like what felt like a proper goodbye Mm -hmm. and was really nice. And I was like, okay, like I feel like I can finally shut this door now. And once I did, I – I always knew that I was all in, but I was like, I could feel myself turning a corner and I was really, you know, happy to be there at that point. And I started, you know, to get out more. I had to branch out. I had to stop just sitting in my apartment and in my room and be like, you have to go explore. Like you're not gonna, you're going to continue to (laughs) compare San Diego to Portland as long as you shy away from actually moving on and finding a life in Portland for yourself. But part of me didn't want to find a life in Portland because I was scared that it was just going to get uprooted. Like everything did in San Diego. So you're constantly like different mental battles with yourself of being like, well, I need to open up to this place. But if I do, then I might be traded and I'm, you know, why did I open you know, my heart to another place? Like I'm going to get hurt all over again. It feels like relationships. You're like, Oh my gosh, (laughs) well, if I do this and like, this is going to happen. And it was a very like back and forth, like some days I'd be really happy and like be super satisfied with Portland. And then other days I'd be like, wow, like I just really miss my life. And not to mention my dog didn't go with me because he's a puppy and that was just too much movement for him. So he stayed home with my family in San Jose while I moved up to Portland and we had a lot of traveling to do in Portland. And I was like, I can't, I can't do that to him. I can't expect him to be able to, which sounds funny because he's a dog, but he's, (laughs) a puppy and is now lived in just as many states as I have. So yeah. Um, so it was it was a hard situation, but I think it was, you know, like I said, it was all in time. It's all finding the reasons like why things happen and letting them come to you and not searching for them and just, you know, just trusting that things happen for a reason. That everything in life happens for a reason. And so it was hard. The trade was hard um but I found my way through it and Mm. I'm very happy that the trade ended up happening yeah Uh, where do you kind of fall on the on the the line between like I think the game is so amazing because it brings so many people into your life and you have these beautiful friendships and relationships that last for a long time and and I mean I'm sure you know you've already said it like some of our best friends are people that we've shared a field with because there's just something different about, you know, doing something like playing a, yep. you know, a match together and kind of training week in and week out. But also then mm-hmm. like, there's that kind of harsh reality of it where oftentimes these relationships can be short lived and like, you can get so close to these people over the course of a few months or a season or a year. And then, you know, I, I mean, there's people who I love who I played with in 2019 that I haven't gotten to see via COVID and they're here and I'm there. Yep. Like, it's uh it's hard but it's also beautiful and I I can't seem to wrap my head around which one I want to go with it's it's really hard I think it's one of those where I'm like as long as I continue to decide playing this I have to be ready to be uprooted at any moment which sucks because you don't want to do that 
I think it's when being uprooted really affects the way that I see soccer is when it's going to be time to be like, wow, like this is no longer making me happy. It's Mm -hmm. making me miserable. It's making me question who I am, what I want to do. If I want to continue living this lifestyle, I think it's one of those where it's like, okay, like if I sincerely try and give it a shot and I'm just not happy anymore, then maybe, then maybe it's not worth it anymore. But as long as I still feel the fire of wanting to fight and wanting, you know, to play soccer and wanting to prove people that, you know, I don't, that I just don't want to be traded, then like, that's ultimately up to me. And that's when I have to continue to remember, like, you might not be here for as long as you think. And it's always something I have to keep in the back of your head. So I think it's more like, maybe not like it as much because as my parents told me, like, if there's, you know, like, if you're thinking that you want to stay somewhere because of someone or something, like, they'll continue to be in your life Mm -hmm. in another way, if that's what you want, like, and if, like, that's what you truly want and see, but don't give up soccer because you're upset about leaving somewhere or someone. You have to continue to go for it. Now, if you leave and you're still not happy, then at least you know, but you will regret not doing it based on something else that's not soccer itself. Now, if you're just unhappy and you you go to this new place and you're still unhappy with soccer, then like, then you know, then you know when it's your time. But if you get to this new place and you're just mad because you're traded and you felt like you're, you know, undervalued somewhere else and you get somewhere else and, you know, you're playing again and you're really happy, like, think if you would have stopped you yeah. would regret it. You would regret not being able to go out on your own terms. Like, don't allow people to make decisions for you. And that's where you go back to decisions. Like, it's making a decision for yourself and living that decision out and seeing it through. Because I'd be so upset if I would have, you know, let someone else make that decision for me and been like, no, you'll be done now because you don't want to go to Portland. And I'm like, wow, like, I still love it. Like, now that I'm like a couple months removed, I'm like, I would have, you know, really been sad had I said, I don't want to go. I don't want to play anymore because I still love soccer and I'm not done with it yet. But, you know, like I, I trust me, I've asked myself multiple times, like, where do I stop making sacrifices for soccer? Where, Mm. where does that end? Where do I put myself first and stop putting soccer first? And I think that's ultimately just based on the fact of like, if I get on the field day in and day out, if it doesn't make me happy anymore, then, you know, then it's time. But obviously that time hasn't reached yet, but yeah. So it's like I said, just making decisions for yourself and seeing it through. And like you, you are the one who ultimately has to live with those decisions. No one else does. It's you. Yeah. So I'd rather make it for myself and be upset with myself then regret it because someone else made a, a decision for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you hit the nail on the head that I think that's what pushes so many players to kind of keep going when others maybe quit, you know, is, is they still think like, if I, if I keep pushing, there's going to be that time where it all fits and I'm going to, you know, be in a club that values me and I'm going to get to play the style that I want and I'm going to feel happy on the pitch and it's all going to fit together. Um, and and you can kind of hear that in the way that you speak about it. And as you mentioned too, like that kind of fire that you still have for the game and that love for it, like, and and I know, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time so we can even kind of, kind of wrap it sort of here. Like, what are some of those goals that you start to look ahead to maybe in your career, whether it be like, you know, finding kind of all of it fitting together in one place or, you know, goals that you want to achieve from a personal standpoint, team standpoint, what are some of the things that you still look of like, I want to kind of check those boxes um, in my football career list? I think like one of my biggest things is just having like a healthy season, like just an injury free mm-hmm. season where like, I'm just, you know, happy. Like I know there's always going to be this, the small nicks, the small things, like you're never going to be a hundred percent the entire season. Like you're always going to feel something at some point, but nothing yeah. like serious that keeps me out for weeks at a time, nothing that keeps me playing with pain. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy on the field and know that I can sprint after a ball and not feel some sort of pain doing it. So I think that's like, I feel like that's one of like the biggest boxes left that I have to tick is just 
doing that. And I think that's been one of like my biggest motivators for continuing to play is like knowing that I can do it, but just not having the chance so far because I've, you know, just never been super healthy to do it these past couple of years. And like, if I can just get like that one season in me, then I'll know, like, if I'm like, wow, like I had that one healthy season, I'm like, I'm ready to walk away. Or if I'm like, wow, this is like, this is like my push for more now. Like I know like what I can do when I think if I have a healthy season, like a lot more doors will open up for decisions that I want to make. But I think that's like my number one priority is having a healthy season. And if that happens, then maybe I'll have other decisions to make besides just between being done or, you know, continuing to push through it all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just in even speaking to you, your, your mentality and your kind of resiliency like shines through in kind of the way that you talk. And it's it's funny. It almost seems as if like it came full circle. Like when I asked you about when you were younger uh, and like looking at that Stanford goal, you were kind of like, I don't look at what other people, what I need to do to beat other people. I just look at what I need to do to get there. Right. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of like, now you look at it the same way of like, I just want to prove it to myself that I can do it because I know what I'm capable of. And it's not really about proving other people wrong or or proving that I can to anybody else. It's just like, I know myself, I know myself as the player and I know my body and I know what I can do. Um, And it's just, it's cool to see that. And like that, that, that shines through in just the way that you speak about the game and the way that you speak about kind of getting where you want to go. Yeah. I think like one of the biggest things I've learned so far in my pro career is like, you know, you're playing for your team, you're playing for your coach, you're playing for your club. But like you, this is going to sound bad. Like you also have to be selfish in that way. Like if you play for your coach, like that coach could be gone the next season. Mm -hmm. You're not for your coach. Your teammates most likely change just about every year. You're playing, you're always playing for your teammates, but like you can't play for your teammates and your coach if you're not the best you. Yeah. And you that at some point put yourself first so me playing through injuries at the end of the day isn't going to help my team or my coach and it's only hurting me so if I get healthy and I do the things that I need to that's how I help my team that's Mm. how I show my coach that I can play at this next level so I think it's like it's one of those where you know people say don't be selfish and I get it on the field like no but like if you're not selfish off the field and vying for yourself and you know, trying to help yourself, then like, you're never going to get to the point that you want to because you're so focused on everything else besides you, that it's never going to help you become that next player. You have to focus on yourself at points. Yeah, yeah, you can't give that best to the team if you haven't made sure to look after yourself. It's it's really true. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Well, Tegan, I can't thank you enough. This has been a lot of fun and I'm sure so many out there listening are going to gonna get a lot out of this. And uh, yeah, like I said, I just appreciate you taking the time and, and thanks, for, thanks for chatting with us. Of course. Thanks for having me. And that is a wrap on the Tegan McGrady episode. Thank you so much to her for taking time out of her off season and her routine to share her story and and to chat with all of us. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you out there who have continued to listen week in and week out, continue to, you know, highlight these footballers, highlight their amazing stories and, and, and be kind of on this journey along with us. I greatly appreciate it. And I look forward to sharing even more stories with you in the coming episodes. So the only thing that I ask you here at the very end is if you like the show, if you like this particular episode, go ahead and share it with a friend. Let them know to check out some of these stories. And I think the more that this community grows, the more that these stories are out there, the more that people can learn, the more that people can be inspired by some of the amazing things that all of these athletes out there do. So once again, thank you to all of you out there and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>